You're listening to the Business Consulting Buzz podcast at www.consulting-business.com. Hi, everyone. It's Michael Zapersky from Business Consulting Buzz. Today, Gordon Graham, uh, we have him on the show. He's a white paper writer and consultant. He's worked with Google, Oracle, Intuit, uh, among many other Fortune 500 companies. He's interviewed over 200 C-level executives and written over 170 white papers. Gordon is based in Ontario, Canada. I'm excited to have Gordon on the show today because he's not only a white paper writer, he's a very accomplished consultant and a master at marketing his craft. Gordon, welcome. Oh, well, thank you very much. Gordon, I touched on the kind of companies that you work with. Uh, did I get that right? Can you tell us more about the, the work that you're doing these days? Well, sure. I'm uh, basically a B2B copywriter. I've done lots of other things in my life, technical writing for uh, software companies and uh, journalism. And uh, then I was a marketing executive in a software company. And that's that's when I found that there are certain types of marketing documents that, that really work better than others. So I focused on those. And uh, now I'm an independent copywriter, and I, I really specialize in white papers and case studies. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think you, you've accomplished a lot from, from our previous discussion, uh, but I think it's also important, and you touched a little bit on this, but that it's important that people listening to this realize that you spent many years working as a freelancer, then an employee, then a VP of marketing before really establishing your, your specialization, correct? Yeah, I guess it was around uh, 2001. I got very, very interested in white papers in 2005 or so. I set up my uh, website. So I was already... Um, Gee, I guess I was already in my 40s at that point, so it, it took me a little while to hit to hit the uh, the thing that I think I'll be doing the rest of my uh, career. Right. Okay. So let's talk about that specialization for for a minute. Um, but before we do that, when you were the the VP of marketing at a, at a hardware software company, you found that uh, that most methods of marketing weren't working that well, uh, but one did better than all all the rest. Can you share that story? Oh, sure. Are you talking about the little booklet we did, the little special report that we did? or uh... I think so, yeah. yeah and that's, okay. We're kind of talking about how that maybe led to, to white papers and, and exploring that whole area. Yeah, well, um, that was in the late 90s, and we were a, a quick, a quick growing uh, software company, hardware company. We did, we did um, barcoding or data collection for ERP systems like Oracle and, and SAP. And so we were an add-on product to those big uh, giant products. And we really tried every possible uh, channel of marketing. So we tried, uh, we had our website early on, which was, which was fine. We tried uh, all different types of uh, marketing collateral. We went to trade shows, of course. We did some advertising. We did direct mail. And the thing that, the, th- the two things that I found really got the most traction were case studies or customer stories. And those are, there's a kind of industry standard format for those kind of two page uh, PDFs written up like a mm-hmm. magazine article. Those um, those just get eaten eaten up, and uh, um, prospects love them because uh, what they do is really reassure someone that's thinking of, that's looking at uh, buying from you that another company pretty similar to theirs had a good experience with you, and um, so they're an extended testimonial from a third party, much more powerful than uh, than say advertising where you're beating your own chest, and uh, they're very factual, they're very driven by uh, actual events, and then uh, um, white papers tend to be on a higher level talking about an entire uh, a problem that afflicts an entire industry, so where a customer story talks about a specific experience of one customer, a white paper talks about a whole industry or a whole niche that's experiencing a certain problem and um, pr- suggests a better way to tackle that problem. So, I, and that's right. that's also quite um, ideally they are quite educational and they provide very useful information that can actually help a business person to understand an issue, to um, solve a problem, or to make a decision about which way to go in the future. So th- those right. two, Thanks. sorry. I was just going to ask you, Gordon, so back to, to when you were the VP of marketing this company, how did you, I mean, what specifically were you, you said you were trying a lot of different things, uh, and then you noticed that these kind of case studies, you know, customer stories were working really well. Can you give us, you know, a little bit more insight into exactly what you were doing at that time? I mean, how were you putting these out? Where, you know, were they just put up on your website? Were you, 
Were they going to trade publications? A little bit more detail around okay. how you were actually using these. Well, the classic way to do a, a, a customer story hasn't changed much over the years. You get a customer that's very, very happy, sort of a raving fan uh, who agrees to be interviewed, um, and you interview them and write it up in a, in a one- or two-page uh, article that you uh, format like as a PDF, put it on your website, but that's only the beginning. Uh, customer stories are so powerful because you can you can repurpose them in about 25 different ways. So, for instance, you can pull a, um, a, some slides for a company slide deck out of it. You can uh, extract, a, um, if you record the interview, you can extract a nice little MP3 uh, audio testimonial out of them. You can use the, a mm-hmm. little snippet on a website with the company's uh, logo, and then you can click through to get the bigger uh, um, the bigger story. You can use uh, an especially detailed uh, customer story for a presentation at an industry event or a conference. So they're they're just the most rich um, material for uh, for repurposing. And you can of course also include those, tuck those into any kind of package where you're responding to an RFP, or your uh, um, you can send a link to them or, or the PDF themselves out to uh, a, a fresh prospect. And the uh, uh, really my advice uh, for those is to make sure that you have one for every major customer segment. So if you sell, mm-hmm. say you sell on the East Coast, um, okay, well you want to have a, a good customer on the East Coast, but say you sell, you sell into, uh, say you, you consult into two different vertical uh, markets, you want to have one customer story for each vertical market. So you would have two great customers in the right location, one in each of your uh, of your chosen verticals, and that covers that covers your market. And then you think, um, how often do you need to put out a new one? You might want to put out a new one every six months or every uh, year or so. But you have to keep a nice f- uh, fresh flow of those coming. Um, so that's in terms of the customer stories. Uh, the uh, the white paper that we really did that got us the, the in- incredible results was uh, you wouldn't look at it and think it was a white paper because we published it like a little booklet, and it was called How to Unleash the Power of Your ERP System with uh, Barcoding. And okay. uh, it was kind of like a um, fictionalized customer story because it, the, uh, the story was a walkthrough of a fictitious company we called Acme Tricycle Works and it was the uh, our two classic um, uh, personalities or personas involved in a sale it was a uh, the uh, um, Mike the marketing no it was Victor the vice president and okay, um, yeah. yeah forget the name of the engineer but there's a technical there's a kind of an IT I can call him IT the um, Ivan, the IT uh, advisor, and they were walking. So you really set the, you really set the stage though within this, so that um, you'd have the, the people that would generally be involved in the sale. Those were kind of the two main characters. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And it was as simple as a children's story. They were basically walking through the tricycle works, us uh, pausing at every section of their factory. So they were they were at shipping and receiving. And um, then they were at uh, their their inventory of parts supplies, and then they were at their main production line. Uh, and then they walked through the office, and they pointed out where the finance guys sit. And, and they used to, and they would talk about. Remember how how uh, terrible it was last uh, Christmas when we had all those orders and we couldn't fill them, and everybody was going crazy. Boy, uh, last Christmas after we got our uh, data collection system, things were so much smoother. Eh? Oh yeah, that was great. So they had a little. It was mostly dialogue, plus sprinkled with some factoids. I went back for through about ten years worth of trade magazines for that uh, niche and uh, sprinkled in a lot of little facts and figures about the, the smallest barcode uh, ever made was were ones glued to the uh, um, abdomens of honeybees to track honeybee uh, um, right okay you know uh, travels and the biggest one ever made was on the side of a battleship stuff like that you know just to give it a little interest that book was about uh, i think 48 pages it cost us a fair bit it cost us about $25,000 um all told to print that and research it and write it uh, but mm-hmm. the result was millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of, of sales. And what uh, our, our West Coast sales rep put it best, and he said, uh, when I go into a, uh, a uh, meeting with a prospect and I lay out a copy of our, our handbook in front of every place uh, for everybody on the selection committee, I can see in their eyes that we have just raised up the vendor list to the very top of the list because we uh, we look serious and we're doing something um, that we obviously invested in that, that uh, we believe in because it's a physical object that's printed and it's really simple and accessible and it, and it explains some of the benefits helps paint the picture of some of the benefits that that 
our prospective company may enjoy if they buy from us. So it, mm-hmm. um, that that was an expensive project, probably more expensive than uh, than your uh, um, listeners will want to uh, want to tackle. But the principle remains. You know, if you put out useful information that helps your prospects understand an issue or solve a problem, they are going to really, really eat it up. And that's a great example because even though it cost you twenty five thousand dollars, you know, back back in those days when you when you launched it, it made you millions and millions of dollars. So the, the you know your ROI on that was obviously very strong. Yes, yes, because the typical sale, including um, hardware, software, and services, was uh, one hundred fifty thousand and up. So we didn't have to right. we didn't have to make too many sales to uh, pay back for that uh, um, that booklet. So let's let's talk a little bit more about why do white papers work so well? I mean, even going back to this this scenario, I've I've heard you say a few different things, um, and, and the one that you mentioned just right now is that when the salesperson goes to, into a meeting and they put this booklet on the table, you know that gets that got the people's um, the vent, their attention as a way to stand out. But what are the other reasons that a white paper works so well as a marketing tool? That's a really great question, and I'm going to uh, think for an instant and uh, give you my uh, best answer. I think on the highest level, uh, white papers are uh, fit into this this huge uh, trend of marketing with content. And um, your listeners have probably heard that, although I guess it may be a little fuzzy idea for for some people. The idea of marketing with content really arose because of the web. You know, in the old days, people used to have to, B2B buyers used to have to deal with salespeople, you know, to find out any specifications or any pricing or any really anything about your offer. They would have to talk to a salesperson and the salesperson would uh, get them in their, uh, in their clutches and do the typical sales thing. The salespeople have been more or less disintermediated. They've been cut out of the process. The middleman is gone. Something like 90, the last survey I saw was 96%, I believe, of all B2B shoppers start the process by doing a search. And most of those are going to be doing a Google search, two-thirds mm-hmm. of them, right? So this is how a, uh, a B2B sale begins these days. And uh, people serve themselves. Uh, B2B buyers serve themselves. So they come to your website in, uh, in Google. They click on it. They look around. What are they going to, what are they going to be most attracted to? You know, right. I, I guess I've got something, uh, something a, a little, a bit of a hard uh, truth uh, to impart, which is that um, nobody cares about your company, really. There we are trying to get our good image and get a nice logo and, and get our website all together and tell people how proud we are of our company. Nobody cares. They care about their problems, just like we care about our problems. So. It, it, I guess one of the things I would recommend um, to your listeners is is to stop fussing about their branding and their logo and their uh, their company name and the and stop twiddling with their uh, their uh, graphics on their web pages. I mean, the most important thing is to is to really turn it around and put yourself in your prospect's shoes and think about their troubles. And so, marketing with content, what it does is uh, ideally is B two B vendors generate content that really engages prospects, that helps them, that gives them some useful uh, information or uh, education. And, and of course, there's all different channels of, uh, of content, and there's all the social media right now. But um, I would separate in, my, in uh, uh, our minds things like social media, uh, Twitter and uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. Those are not really ways to publish content. Those are ways to point to content. So mm-hmm. um, if you've got, it doesn't matter if you have 8,500 followers on Twitter, if you don't have anywhere to send them, I mean, they're not going to be very engaged. But if you go out to Twitter and say, hey, we've just published this fantastic white paper about six things you really must know before you, you know, sign on the dotted line for our type of service, and it's a, and it's a useful piece of, uh, of uh, content, you'll get a lot of traction out of that. And the, uh, the other great thing, so I guess that's a high level marketing. White papers are a form of marketing with content. There's all different right. forms. C- customer stories are a form of marketing with content. But I believe that uh, white papers are really the top of the pyramid, the king of content, because nothing else will work for as long and generate the kind of results as consistently as a well-done white paper. 
And why, why is that though, Gordon? I mean, when you and, and I, I must apologize, I didn't really set up this. You know, this I think we're really digging into to the action bite for today. Okay. And I didn't really I, I didn't really set that up, but I think where this conversation is going, and I'm glad that it is going this way, um, is really getting into the heart of what we we're going to cover in the action bite. So let's just keep rolling with it. But but on that point, I mean, why? Again, why does it work so well, um, you know, compared to to other things out there? Um, you're saying that it's the, you know the white paper is kind of the king, but when you look at all the other options that people have, what is it really that makes the white paper work so well? Well, let's let's compare it to one that's very, that's growing in popularity. Say videos, right? I mean, everybody likes watching videos, and uh, and there, there's a big discussion right now. Our white paper's dead. Nobody likes to right. read. People are gonna uh, just watch video from now on. You know, forget forget uh, all this text. Just do video. Well, I have a few I have a few problems with that, and one is that um, for I've seen firsthand, and I know how uh, I operate, and I talk to um, my clients all the time, and they tell me about how how uh, a complex B two B sale takes place, um, and they're getting more complex, and they're taking longer, and they're drawing in more and more people because everybody is more risk adver- averse these days, right? Nobody mm-hmm. wants to make a mistake. It can be a really career limiting uh, problem if uh, somebody in a company hires the wrong consulting uh, uh, firm or buys the wrong system or even buys the wrong office chair. So everybody's cautious and everybody's watching their uh, their pennies. Um, so no other form of content is as meaty and as substantial mm. and as well researched and as thoughtful and uh, um, as substantial as a white paper, uh, a six to eight page white paper uh, with uh, footnotes that took uh, that took a, a group uh, a month or six weeks to create. That is going to have some meat in it compared to say a video um, walkthrough of your company showing people dancing on their desks or even a video right, yeah. showing you you know your a top executive as a talking head going blah 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 I mean that people may watch that but the people you that that I want to influence are the people on the selection committee who are going to spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars and those people right have to do more than watch videos. Those people have to do some serious reading and thinking and and um, talking and make a make a wise uh, collective decision. Nobody's going to say, "Hey, I saw this great movie on video. Let's everybody uh, let's uh, let's the CFO and the CEO and the C uh, uh, you know everybody let's all sit around the uh, conference table and watch this video on YouTube because it's great." Are you kidding me? That just does right. not happen. What happens is people pass around uh, reports. They email each other things. They they may snip out a, a few uh, the first page of a white paper and pass it around to everybody on the committee. A white paper sums up a vendor's best thinking and best argument and their best shots at their competitors. You know, um, very few people have the skills or the budget to do that in a video. I mean, right. videos are great. But if you if you wanted to do a video that was as effective as a white paper, you'd have to spend five times as much to produce it, and you'd have to get an experienced director and experienced uh, script writer and some acting talent and lighting and makeup. You know, I'm not saying that video is a is a bad medium. It's fantastic. Everybody likes watching video. But to really move um, a, a business buyer down the uh, sales cycle. Uh, a, for a complex, expensive sale, a white paper is going to work far better than a video. So, Gordon, let me ask you. There's two things that you've mentioned here that I, I want to um, kind of dig into. One is, uh, initially, you talked about how you put together this booklet in, at a, in a previous company when you're the VP of marketing, 40 pages, big impact, big ROI I got for you. But you just mentioned here that a white paper really only needs to be six to eight pages. Yeah. Uh, well researched, obviously well put together. So. That's, I guess, one thing to, to clarify. So it only needs to be around six to eight pages. Is that correct? Yeah, the typical length for a white paper is six to eight pages, sure. And uh, that booklet that we did, that's why I'm, I'm um, saying it, it. you might not look at it and think it was a white paper, but it really served right. the very same purpose, and it was just a slightly more elaborate one. I mean, I wrote okay. a white paper for Google that I think was 25 pages, but that was mm-hmm. that was trying to sum up an entire industry development, and it was uh, used at a, at a conference. Uh, they did, made a presentation based around that. So, I mean, there, these things can be longer or shorter. And uh, in fact, if we want to talk about um, maybe my, my action bite that I might suggest to your, uh, to your listeners, um, 
I think that uh, just about every consultant should have some kind of numbered list uh, white paper. And those could be really only a couple of pages long, or they could be three pages. They don't have to be six to eight pages. And um, just- Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. That would be great because as you're – you know, mentioning what the kinds of uh, white papers that you've you've created and some of the examples to this point, a lot of it, I think, some of the list, some of our listeners might uh, be thinking, well, that sounds like this is you know for a much larger company or for you know going after maybe a more, much more complex sale. But if we can, yeah, put this in context for a consultant, uh, that would be great. Yeah, well, you know, let's uh, let's talk about what you just said because that was an that was an excellent point, Michael. Uh, um, People think that only large companies do uh, white papers. So if you if you manage in your two to three person uh, consulting firm to put out a nice white paper, you're going to look big, and you're going to you're going to it'll help uh, level the playing field between you and a and a bigger competitor. So uh, um, I'm just uh, zipping down as we speak through some that I've done, and I want to uh, read you out the ones uh, that I've done for small companies. Uh, how to avoid five blind spots in internet filtering. That was a very small software company. Um, okay. And uh, there's one that I'm looking for. How to cut wireless costs. Five strategies and 14 tactics for CFOs. That's a two-person company. Um, seven steps to a sensible BYOD strategy so you can sleep at night. That's for about a 10-person consulting company in uh, North Carolina. And BYOD is bring your own device. So this is the... This is the idea that people will bring their own iPhones and their own uh, iPads to work and want to use them. So seven steps to a sensible BYOD strategy so you can sleep at night. And then uh, one of my one of my favorite ones, I'm looking for it here so I make sure to get it. Um, nine best practices for colleges and universities moving to online course evaluations. That was a uh, – I'm reading you all the ones that are that are numbered lists, right? But right. even Google, I did one, uh, seven factors to consider when choosing a search bid optimization platform. Seven tough questions every insurer must ask about your next hospital contract. That's a, that's a, a very small company. Um, so, Gordon, I mean, really what you're saying here, though, is that it doesn't matter the size of your company and – it doesn't matter if you're a consultant or a technology firm, software, you know, uh, or otherwise. Uh, really, consultants can use white papers um, to differentiate themselves in the marketplace and and as a very effective marketing tool to to get the attention and, and earn trust um, of the kinds of clients that they want to work with. Absolutely, you're just you're just saying so many uh, so many um, uh, great things. The uh, uh, let's look at the trust factor. You know, I started talking about marketing with content and putting out useful information. So what's the difference between a company that publishes useful content, even if they're a, a one-person company, like I'm a one-person company, I've got some contractors, but uh, I'm a right. one-person company. I've got a uh, special report on my website that's been downloaded something like 1,500 times. It's called How to Pick the Perfect Flavor for Your Next White Paper. It's about a 15-page white paper. Um, and it, I'm really trying to help people understand the main types, the three main types of, uh, of white papers. I call them chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. So the cover of that report is a, right. is a three scoops of ice cream. I can't tell you how many people have said, oh, I just love that ice cream report. I, that's what I call it, my ice cream report. That's what everybody calls it. And we're thinking of doing a chocolate flavor. You know, that is so great. Um, I'm not saying at the end of it, you got to come to me and I'll write you a white paper. I'm saying here's how to use white papers more effectively. Um, so that's an example from my own personal uh, business. But here's the one I wanted to tell you about. Uh, um, six things you must know before you buy business process software. Now, this is a, a one-person uh, company. He's uh, a process consultant, and he really understands this one genre of software very well. It's called um, business process software. And what he's saying in here is uh, – you know, um, this kind of software only works for very structured processes. Most of what knowledge workers do is unstructured. The most valuable business processes are unstructured. Your key people probably won't want to use this kind of software, but there's a middle way to uh, to bring in and, and gain some of the benefits of this type of uh, software. We're calling that a framework, and uh, your key people will enjoy using a framework if you present it to them correctly. So he's saying, bef- wait, before you buy some of this stuff and tie your company up in knots, read this. And um, – I got to believe that somebody that reads this and goes, hmm, maybe we were about to make a huge blunder and spend a quarter million dollars on this uh, business process software. And, you know, according to this guy, uh, it's not even going to help us. It's going to hurt us. You know, right. uh, 
I have the feeling that uh, a lot of those people are going to pick up the phone and uh, and uh, want to get him uh, in for a call. And that's this is his main go-to-market device he's been using, and it's been working just fine for him because he's helping people understand a problem, right, or see an issue or see a wider horizon. Now, he basically wrote that, and I helped him tweak it a little bit. Um, but you can see these six things, five things, seven things, four issues, seven gotchas, the numbered list is what I call it, is a, a fantastic um, uh, format because everybody likes reading them. They uh, promise a nice, short, uh, snappy read. You can uh, repurpose them as blog posts. They're just, they're just uh, fantastic. And uh, as far as, as far as the trust goes, so say, say that your a company is looking at three different consulting firms. And one of them gives them the, uh, a white paper like this, and the other two say, "Oh yes, we can help you. Uh, we can help you install a business process software." Who do you think they're going to trust more? The ones that, that that are saying, "Oh yeah, we're so good, and and uh, we can really help you and uh, sign here," or the guy that's saying, "Wait, here's something you got to understand before you go for this, and uh, um, here's some useful information I've learned in my 10 years uh, working with this kind of software." I mean, who are they going to trust? Mm-hmm. I think that that most buyers are going to trust the company that gives them some some useful information instead of just trying to get them to sign on the dotted line. And and this is it, it, totally um, applicable to small uh, small consulting firms. You know, the thing that um, I have interviewed lots of business executives, and and the number one problem that they generally get around to saying, if I ask what's your biggest problem, you know, especially smaller companies, they will often say. Well, you know, um, sure, it's hard, uh, the economy, everything. But, you know, what's really hard is is us standing out from the crowd, you know. Uh, everybody in our niche uh, talks the same. They use the same lingo. We, we all have about the same prices. It, it's really hard for us to stand out and, and be different. And if, if we're up against some competitors, uh, you know, it's really hard for us to get our edge and, and uh, gain any kind of uh, advantage over them. Well, you know, uh, Marketing with content is the way to to gain an edge. Uh, becoming a becoming a trusted advisor puts is exactly what consultants want, right? I mean, they right. want they want their we want our customers to uh, to trust us and listen to us. And uh, well, I guess the classic thing is know what is it know us and meet us, know us and like us, something like that, you know. And um, well, I think you said it very well, Gordon, before when you said that everyone wants to stand out from the from the crowd, but no one wants to do you know really do anything different. So yeah. it's like this mindset that, as you mentioned, you know everyone wants to really have an advantage. They want to to be seen in the marketplace as an authority. To, you know they want to have that trust. But at the same time, most consultants and most people in business are just trying to you know they end up doing the same thing that everyone else is doing, um, just thinking that they're going to try and do it better. But when there's clearly ways that you can stand out in the marketplace, and, and you know, using white papers is is a really good um, is is a really good you know is one of those really good ways to do that. So um, I think that's great. I, I want to just I'm looking at the time here, and um, and I want to dig into to one thing that, that really stood out to me, and that's okay. the, that I think you you have one of the best defined specializations and, and focus I've seen. I mean, on your website. Yeah, your value proposition, your statement is is very clear. You say, I help B2B technology firms tell their stories with crisp, compelling white papers. When you work with me, your white papers generate more leads, create more buzz, and cement more sales. I mean, that is so focused. And and here also, I mean, Gordon, why aren't you saying that, you know, you in the beginning you mentioned that you're really a copywriter, but why aren't you saying that you're a writer or a marketing writer or a copywriter you know, on on your website and in your marketing materials? I mean, why are you focusing so narrow um, on you know on being a writer specifically for white papers? Well, I guess it goes back to you know when you do an elevator pitch. A lot of a lot of people. Um, Give their elevator pitch as a as a label, right? I, just a kind of genre. Of, I am a copywriter. I'm a B two B copywriter. I'm a consultant. I'm a process consultant. I'm a SharePoint consultant. You know, um, that really doesn't uh, isn't a very good conversation starter. Because what reaction do you get? You usually get if you say if you if you just label yourself, then other people just nod and go okay, and then they uh, go back to wanting to talk about baseball or whatever they were just thinking about. You know, it doesn't, it's not open ended at all. So um, by me saying I help companies tell their stories, 
uh, that's a little bit open-ended. That might intrigue somebody. They might say, well, how do you, how do you help a company tell their story? What's that mean anyway? Chris, compelling white papers. What, uh, what are white papers? I wonder if white papers could uh, help my company tell our story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the benefits after that are, you know, this is how I stand out from the crowd. There's a lot of copywriters out there. Um, and there's a lot but, of. But weren't you weren't you concerned? At, you know, uh, when you first got into this business and really, um, you know, selected the specialization, didn't you have the concern that by saying that you fo- you know specialize in white papers and even going further than that, just saying that you do it just for B two B technology firms, didn't you have a concern that you would lose business? Well, that happens to be a huge niche with more business than I can possibly deal with. But uh, right. it. Um, so I was fortunate there to have a rich, uh, rich, happy hunting grounds. But it doesn't stop anybody. I mean, that I know of. I still get lots of uh, lots of inquiries from people saying, uh, um, "Well, do you write about medical devices? Do you write about uh, um, the insurance industry? Do you write about consulting uh, uh, companies?" So they may. And you will, right? Uh, sure, sure, sure. My my sweet spot is really technology, uh, technology, yeah. software. But uh, I've written about I've written about medical devices and um, hospitals and negotiating with insurance companies over over health care costs and uh, all kinds of things. And um, I have to admit that when I go out of my specialty, it takes me more research and those projects sure. are a little less profitable, but they're but they're interesting, you know. And so I didn't I didn't want a totally steady diet of, uh, of just uh, just one thing. But if, if you look, say you Google um, copywriters, you know, you're going to probably get well, gee, I should do that right now and tell you, but uh, <laughs> you yeah, probably it'll, it'll get millions, a... eh? Um, right. What have we got here? 34 million uh, results for copywriters. But if you if you Google uh, white paper writers, um, and I'm I'm fortunate, I'm at the top of the list there. You get uh, um, one tenth as many. So I don't know. Right. It's uh, no, and you know, Gordon, I'm I'm playing a bit of the devil's advocate here because. You know, this is this is what I uh, suggest to you know to all consultants as well is the, the importance of having a specialization and, and using that to really um, you know establish your your um, your credibility and your authority status and and all of that. And it, you know, it makes so much sense. But a lot of people have this concern that by focusing so much, you know, you're really going to be shutting down a lot of the market uh, and losing a lot of potential business. But I found it to be the opposite of that, and I think you're a great example of, of just how that's not the case and how your ben- business uh, has really benefited from having a, a clear specialization. Uh, and at the same time, you just mentioned that you're still open to taking on other projects, even though you know it may not be your, your sweet spot uh, or the core of what you do. But if it's a good fit with the client, um, you know, and it, it definitely hasn't stopped clients from other industries that aren't in that sweet spot from contacting you, because if they see the need uh, for them, then they're obviously curious if you're able to help them as well. Yeah, and it gives a, a conversation opener, right? They'll they'll contact me and say, well, have you ever worked with uh, with anybody in our niche? And chances are, I have, or I've done something similar. I've helped a company with their marketing uh, challenge. But I wanted to I wanted to maybe help help your listeners uh, drill down into that idea of specializing uh, a little bit because I, I think there's really two dimensions of specialization. There's there's a horizontal. Um, specialization and there's more of a vertical specialization. So I would say, okay. um, I'll start with an example of, of my own uh, business and then uh, maybe we can extend that out. But say, as a, as a writer, I can specialize in a type of document like white papers or case studies. Copywriting is pretty fuzzy. So if you focus that down in, I focused it down in on white papers. I would I would call that kind of a a horizontal focus in what I'm doing. And then I can focus in a vertical market like uh, B2B technology or even more fine like B2B software. And then, of course, like going to medical devices or something is a little bit outside of that. And then if you put those two on top of each other, you get a super super laser focus. You know, I write... um, B two B. I write white papers for B two B software companies. That's super mm-hmm. focused, uh, and uh, fortunately, that's a nice big uh, market, as I was saying. So, how would that apply to any other consulting company? Well, I think there's, I think there's uh, vertical markets, of course, and many consulting companies specialize in a certain vertical, you know, like manufacturing or retail or, or travel or whatever. But there's then, then there's this horizontal um, slice too about what do you actually do. Do you help people um, 
generate more leads? Do you help people uh, hire uh, effectively and manage their staff and keep them happy? Do you help people um, factor their invoices? I mean, there's a, a million things that can, consultants can do and talk about and help, right? And and so if you take that slice, but you're of what you do, but you do it for anybody in any industry then at certain times you're going to have to learn a little bit more about a certain industry or there'll be some some uh, differences from one industry to the other that will uh, um, mean you have to do a little bit more research but you can do it if if you've got a, a deep enough company and you can you can do pretty well that that horizontal task that thing that you specialize in for anybody that activity is i look at that as a the horizontal thing and then the vertical is the type of company it could be the size it could be the location it, most often it's the um, economic niche right or the sector that they're in mm-hmm. and that, and when you specialize by sector you learn of course all of the jargon and all of the main players and the trends and the issues within that uh, sector very very well so that you can speak knowledgeably to anybody else in that sector so the the hyper specialization for a consulting company would be we do this for companies in this niche right so it's the the, vert- the the horizontal is is what you do, the vertical is who you do it for, and then maybe one thing to add to that, uh, if I'm correct here, uh, is and I think you do this very well is talk about what you know what the res- uh, the results that you generate are. So you know we do this for this, and this is the re- you know this is the result or the expectation or the the deliverable or the outcome that you'll be able to achieve. Yeah, what- yeah, yeah, and the and the ultimate way to um, prove your results is to have your own customer stories or testimonials you know i've been i've been kind of too busy to write up my own but i do have a a list of samples with a a short little testimonial from about 12 different companies on my site and that's uh that's doing the trick for now right okay and then so gordon how about a, a few as we're kind of getting near near the end here could you offer a few quick tips for the consultant listening to this that's thinking, okay, you know, I'm, I'm sold on the idea of, of white papers. Uh, it's something that I, you know, that I think I should move forward with or, or consider creating. What's a, a quick overview of uh, some key points that the consultant should keep in mind when creating a white paper? Well, I think that it's it's really important to put yourself in the shoes of your prospects. Uh, forget talking about your own company and think about what is a nagging problem that they have been dealing with. The problem that your company or one of the problems that your company exists to help them solve. Think about that mm-hmm. and start off with that um, with that uh, frame of mind and then think about what you could say, your best thinking that you could offer them that you're not afraid to give away. And they, a lot of consultants are uh, are afraid to reveal their methods or their concepts or their insights. Well, gee, you know, um, as long as you're afraid and you hold yourself back and you do what everybody else does, you're not going to stand out from the crowd. But uh, believe me, as soon as you start standing up and saying, this is what we think, this is what we believe, uh, and this is how it helps people, and this is this terrible problem that uh, um, – this, our industry is facing, and and these are the ways that people have tried to tackle in the past. None of those are any good. Here's a better way to do it. And you're mm-hmm. not doing it in a pushy, salesy kind of way. You're doing it in a way to try to help educate people. Um, right. That will help you uh, stand out. And that and the uh, the numbered list is the, is the best way to do that. So all all you do for a numbered list is you uh, you basically take a uh, one of these issues that your prospects are. Uh, it kind of keeps them up at night. You take one of these uh, terrible problems and then you just start free associating and thinking, well, gee, what, what seven or eight things could we tell them about that? You know, uh, try and get a list of 20 things, 20 tips about, uh, um, I read you down the list of the six things you must know before you buy business process uh, software, you know, but there's a, so that's an example, but you think about just, Blips, you know, they don't have to be built into any big, long, connected narrative. It's a mosaic, right? So it's an idea here, an idea there. Oh, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing. Oh, and what about this? Oh, yeah, and there's that too. Oh, yeah, and here's another thing. So it can be tips. It can be questions. It can be gotchas. It can be uh, best practices. Um, and then keep the best. Keep the most powerful six or seven or eight of them and uh, 
uh, write up a couple of paragraphs under each one, and there you've got a, a very, very handy, uh, um, useful white paper. In fact, I can give you a, a quick example. You know, and this is a, at the very, very low end of the market, the most uh, simplistic version of a white paper you'd, you'd ever hear of. Say, uh, Joe the plumber. You know, Joe the plumber. There's Joe the plumber. There's John the plumber. There's Jake the plumber. How is, how is uh, Joe going to stand out? Well, he decides to put together a little report, and it's, uh, you know, eight plumbing jobs you can do yourself and four you should never touch with a 10-foot bowl. So, mm-hmm. so he can say, okay, you can replace a washer. Okay, you can whatever. But you better not try to replace a whole toilet by yourself or replace a whole water heater by yourself. You know, so if you've got water all over your basement and it's leaking out of your water uh, heater that, that broke, you better, call a, you better call a plumber. And he puts that out on his website and... Uh, Somebody's looking for a plumber, and they come across John, and they come across James, and they come across Jake, and then they come across Joe. And Joe is the only one of the batch that's got something. Here is our free special report about eight jobs you can handle yourself and four that you really should call a plumber about. Who do you think they're going to trust more, and who do you think they're going to like more, and who do you think they're going to call? You know, because they, they'll call up Joe, and I bet you uh, dollars to donuts, some of them are going to say, you know, I saw your report, and, uh, you know, I can do most of my own plumbing, but I, I got a job here that's number three in your list of I better call you. So I figured, you know, I'd give you a call. You're actually, right. you're actually helping them understand something and figure out something and, and deal with, uh, deal with a, a problem, you know? Gordon, you know, I saw on your website that, um, uh, and so your website is thatwhitepaperguy.com. Uh, you have a, an article section which, which actually has some great resources. So for anyone listening to this thinking about uh, writing a white paper, check out Gordon's site because he has some great resources there to help you to plan your white paper. Uh, and uh, even kind of bigger news is that you have uh, a book, uh, White Paper for Dummies, coming out soon. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, that's a, that's one of those uh, infamous books with the uh, black and white black and uh, yellow covers on it white papers for dummies it's uh 384 pages it's uh selling at amazon for about 15 dollars wow that's about a dollar for every uh, year's worth of uh of learning and <laughs> advice that i that i packed in there but uh it's uh um the most comprehensive book on uh white papers that's ever been published it's certainly the longest and it's got uh Everything, uh, everything in there from writing to research to managing to picking the, the right type to which type you need at which, uh, um, part of the funnel. Um, even how to design some tips for how to design a white paper, links to samples on my website. Um, so I, I've, uh, I really hope that, uh, people find that, uh, um, helpful and I, I really packed everything I've learned into, into that book and, uh, I'm uh, very excited. I haven't actually seen it in my hands yet. This is uh, spring of uh, 2013, but it's supposed to be out any day now. Okay. Well, Gordon, again, thank you so much for doing this interview. Really uh, appreciate you sharing your, your wisdom and experience. Uh, so, again, thanks. Well, thank you. I hope that was uh, was useful. And uh, um, if any of your uh, listeners want to uh, want to uh, call me up for a quick chat, I'm uh, I'm always available to give uh, to give some uh, give people my two cents worth. You know. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. For more interviews, articles, and resources on consulting, visit Business Consulting Buzz at www.consulting-business.com.